So welcome everyone. This is Dr. Drizzle and this is our first holiday in the parks. We are so excited that you are here with us today. We have um, many, many students and teachers from around the country that will be joining us. We also have um, some amazing park rangers. We are live on YouTube, so we're going to ask people to keep their um, microphones muted while we present. We will, for teachers and parents, we do have an important address for you. So if you can see it here on my screen, and Sam, I see your picture, so can you give me a thumbs up if you see my screen just to make sure we are good? Great. This address right here at bit.ly backslash holiday padlet. Teachers and parents, that is where you can ask questions. It's where you can upload the uh, products that your uh, students share today. And it's just going to be a place for us to connect. If you are tweeting today, would you please use hashtags expedition and education and tag me at Dacia92. And for my parks, if you will, when you're tweeting today, if you wouldn't mind also adding those to the hashtag and the Twitter handle, that would be very helpful to us as we move through. So we're going to get started right away with our first park, which is Acadia. Now, Acadia is, well, we'll let them tell you where it is. I'm going to stop sharing right now so I can introduce you to Lisa and Crystal from Acadia up in Maine. And I'm going to let them share your screen. And I'm just going to um, remind everybody again, if you will please mute your mics, um, that will be very helpful as we move through this. All right. Take it away, girls. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here today. So we, again, Crystal and I are from Acadia National Park. Our park is located along the coast of Maine. You can see where the red star is. And we have about three and a half million visitors each year. We protect a lot of different environments and ecosystems, including the tallest mountains that are right along the East Coast. Here we are on the top of one of these mountains. Anybody wanna do a little landscape stretching with me today? Go ahead and bring your mountain arms up like me and give it a nice little stretch there. All right. We also have quite the diversity of forest. So if you wanna bring your tree hands up, let them grow everybody and stretch it out. Check out the waves along the rugged coastlines. Go ahead and bring your waves in. We have a lot of tide pools along our coastlines. And we have beautiful lakes. These are part of glacially sculpted U-shaped valley. Everybody make a nice big smile with your finger. You can see the smile in the landscape out there. Now, here in Maine, we, or actually in Acadia, we don't have quite as much snow as inland Maine, but when we do, it is quite beautiful. Now, the animals in Maine are all starting to winterize, and there's a lot of different strategies. Our turtles are hibernating. So this is a picture of a young common snapping turtle. And this is the shell uh, that represents a larger individual. And they will bury down in the mud. They will slow things down and rely on that stored up energy. And some can even soak in oxygen from the water through the skin around their necks and their tails. And not all animals are hibernating during the winter at Acadia National Park. Some animals, like our birds, actually migrate. During the fall, we get to see lots of migrating hawks pass by Acadia as they move south to find warmer weather. And we actually have some birds, like the snowy owl, that come to Acadia for the winter. Snowy owls spend their summers in the Arctic, and they are the largest North American owl by weight. And unlike some owls, they are diurnal, which means they are active during the daytime. They come to Acadia National Park and take advantage of the open spaces that we have on some of our mountaintops. Now, another animal or another strategy out there is to just stay active in the winter, such as our snowshoe hare. They will shed and replace their fur twice a year. And this is triggered by day length. It takes about 10 weeks for the transition to happen to their white winter fur that helps them camouflage in the snow. 
there's actually not any pigment or color in that hair. It's actually filled with trapped air, which keeps them very insulated and warm. If we're lucky, we might be able to find tracks out in the snow. Their really big and furry hind feet actually help them move very efficiently over the landscape and kind of like snowshoes. And snowshoe hares aren't the only animals that are active during the winter time. People are too. In fact, we take advantage of knowing about their snowshoe feet and make our own snowshoes. And these help us walk across the frozen landscape on our trails. We can also go cross country skiing. And if our ponds have frozen over, we can go ice skating. And if you're feeling really adventurous, you can even go snowmobiling. Whatever the season may be, you, there's plenty to see and do at Acadia National Park. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very interesting there. Um, I'm glad that we have been able to visit that place several times. We have been when it was snowing and we were also there in the fall. So we've seen two beautiful places for that. So our next uh, performer, if you will, is uh, Ranger Chelsea. Now, Ranger Chelsea is from Bryce Park. So we're gonna see some different looking uh, landscapes here. So Ranger Chelsea, can you just let me know if you are on um, the line? And Miss Jennifer, if you wouldn't mind, if you would just check down the list and mute people for me that are um, unmuted so we can make sure we're seeing the right people in the screen. Thank you. All right, can you hear me okay? We can. Perfect. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Ranger Chelsea, and I'm calling in from Bryce Canyon National Park. And I actually have two of my ranger friends here with me today. Now, today we're going to talk a little bit. Oop, can you unshare your screen so that I can share mine, Dasha? Perfect. Thank you so much. All right, so we're at Bryce Canyon National Park and we have a lot of interesting things that you can do here in the winter time. It gets pretty snowy and actually we're expecting a big winter storm here this weekend. For those of you who don't know, we're actually in the western part of the United States in southern Utah. And when visitors come to join us here in Bryce Canyon, they can uh, drive down an 18 mile park road and there is some astoundingly beautiful scenes to take in of our hoodoos. Now here at Bryce Canyon, we are known for our hoodoos, which is these really cool geologic formations. And we're known for them because we have the largest concentration of them in the room. And they're also very, very, very colorful. Now also here at Bryce Canyon, some visitors will take in wildlife, take in the scenery, check out our museum and exhibits. But my favorite thing to do in Bryce Canyon in the winter is actually just to sit down and listen. It gets really, really quiet in the winter because oftentimes our visitors tend to leave. And also, if you're at the canyon looking out over the geology in the early mornings, if you get there before the sun hits and just as the sun is hitting, you'll hear our rocks cracking and creaking as they start to thaw from the evening. And I'm going to invite my friend Ranger Taryn in to talk about her favorite aspect of winter here. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Taryn. Um, one thing that I really love about the winter here at Bryce Canyon National Park is that we have some really nice dark skies uh, and being up at 8,000 feet, uh, we have some really nice viewing conditions, especially during the winter when the air is a little bit more still. Uh, so we do constellation tours year round. Um, we do them during winter as long as it doesn't get too cold. Um, so we have rangers out there with the laser pointers like you're seeing in our picture right here. Um, pointing out constellations uh, and telling a little bit about the stories in the night sky. Uh, it's a great time to reflect on your personal connections and on yourself when you're staring up into the night sky and looking at the Milky Way. Uh, we also do full moon hikes when we do have full moons, which are great, especially when there's a bunch of snow on the ground because it's extra bright. Um, but uh, winter at Bryce Canyon is really special um, for the night skies as well. All right. And and then I'm going to invite one more friend in to tell you his favorite aspect of winter here. Hey, all. My name is Jesse. Hey, Katie folk. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I love the winter here. Uh, as previous rangers brought up, the solitude and the night skies are beautiful. One of my favorite aspects is snowshoeing. 
we lead private snowshoe, uh, snowshoe tours here that you have to sign up for. And it's great, especially when it first falls, you see a ton of different animal tracks and we uh, bring visitors to the tracks and we see how we can identify them based on the shape and the size of them. We can see where they're going. Sometimes we see little mice tracks go into the manzanita bushes, which is lots of fun. Uh, we talk about adaptations of plants as well. We talk about deciduous trees versus evergreen trees and how they survive differently in these places. Oops. And uh, yeah, I think my favorite part of the snowshoe hikes is that a lot of times you get to go in places that are not actual trails. Uh, there's enough snow coverage that you can kind of go off the trail and it's okay. Uh, so you kind of go to secret spots in the park that are not accessible in any other time of the year. Yeah. Awesome. So those are just a couple of the many, many things you can do here in winter. And we hope that we get to see you and experience it for yourself. All right. That's all from Bryce Canyon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bryce Canyon. And I love that you guys are wearing your mask. You're practicing that social distancing. Now, if you decide to go visit a park in the next few weeks or months, when you're out there by yourself and hiking around, there's no need for a mask, but I love seeing that people in the parks are really being safe and making sure that they're keeping others safe. So thank you so much. So we have heard from Acadia. We have heard from Bryce Canyon. We have about 120 people watching on YouTube. And just some of the questions that we're getting um, are not really questions, but just excitement like, wow, or I wanna visit there, or mom, can we go? So that means we're probably going to have some busy parks next year. So be ready for that. Our next uh, wonderful park is Cape Cod National Seashore. We were there back in October and we had a wonderful time visiting with um, Ranger Alusha. So Ranger Alusha, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for you. And I will move ahead when you're ready for me to move. So come on out. Right. Make sure you unmute um, yourself. Yeah, um, I think everyone can hear me. And um, so we, Cape Cod National Seashore is located uh, south of Acadia National Park um, on the other side of the Gulf of Maine. And uh, the way most people describe it is if you put your arm out, let's see, I'm trying, to, if, if, uh, it doesn't wanna show with the background. But if you put your arm up and make a fist, that's what Cape Cod looks like. Yeah. <laughs> and I am towards, there we go. I'm towards the end of the fist um, in the province lands um, part of the park. Um, but I have a picture of Salt Pond um, behind me. And I just moved here in June. So I have not yet lived through a full Cape Cod winter and I grew up in Florida, so uh, all of this is pretty new to me. Um, go back, oh yeah. And so um, one of the things, so I had to talk to other rangers and ask them, what do you guys think is cool about uh, living here on Cape Cod in the winter? And um, Ranger Jenna said that for sure, the thing that is the coolest for her is snow on the beach. Cape Cod has 40 miles of uninterrupted beach and um, when you think about beach, what do you think about? You think about a tropical location, maybe with a um, palm trees and flowering plants. But here at this beach, you have snow coming right up to where the waves are hitting. And sometimes you can even, the water is cold enough right there on the edge of the ocean that um, you get what Ranger Jenna called um, slushy waves, where it's sort of like, <laughs> Um, over um, because the salt water is keeping it um, less, um, salt water uh, freezes at a lower temperature than fresh water. So, and it's moving, so it doesn't freeze up like a pond would, like part of salt pond behind me does, but um, it's, um, but it's cold enough that it makes that kind of slushy action. Okay, move on to the next one, Daisha. So places like Salt Pond, um, because it has freshwater seeps, but also has, um, is connected to Nauset Marsh and then out to the ocean. Uh, it keeps open unfrozen water. That's a great place for winter ducks 
to hang out and um, be safe and have a place to um, forage and spend their time during the winter. And one of my favorite winter ducks that we can regularly see, regularly see at Salt Pond behind me is the bufflehead. I think they're just gorgeous. I love that the male and female look different. And because they're black and white, you can spot them from so far off. You just see a black and white um, bird off in the distance on, on a pond or a lake around Cape Cod, and you know it's a bufflehead. And then on to the next slide. And then the other thing I like is that um, there's still plenty of color during the winter season at Cape Cod. Um, partly because there are a lot of um, shrubs that still have berries like the winter berry that I'm holding. Um, so those birds that are coming around um, still have forage that they can be eating here in the winter time. But also, even though we do have plenty of deciduous trees, lots of oaks have already lost their leaves, et cetera, but we have a lot of evergreen trees on Cape Cod. The ones that you see in the picture are pitch pine and they, um, since uh, the park was created in the, in the early 60s, they there um, have been just growing and filling in and really creating some thriving pitch pine forests. So I love to see that winter greenery and the red berries that remind me of Christmas. Um, and then the only other thing I just have to share that has been both exciting and really scary <laughs> living here on Cape Cod for the first time is that we get these big storms in the winter called nor'easters. And unlike a hurricane that has a warm core that creates the cyclone, uh, the nor'easters are created by the difference between cold air coming down from Canada, meeting with warm air in the Atlantic Ocean. And so they have a cold core instead of a warm core like a hurricane, but they can still have winds that are really fast. So last week we had our first nor'easter and I live in a house up on a bluff. The wind was gusting up to um, 80 miles an hour that night. It was hard to sleep. So it's exciting and scary at the same time to be living through a nor'easter up here in Cape Cod. And that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you, Alicia. So we were at Cape Cod also in October and we did two filmings there, one for the Cape Cod Life Saving Stations that you can find on YouTube under um, the National Parks Expedition Challenge, and then another with Ranger Mark when we were actually on the seashore. So thanks for sharing with us. Our next park ranger is going to be Ranger Sam and Ranger Sam is at First State, which is uh, a newer national park. And we were also there in October to be able to film with her and Lauren. So um, Ranger Sam, if you're there, I will run, do you want me to run the slides for you? Or are you gonna share your screen? You can run it, you're doing a great job. I'll just All tell right, you next so. Well, thank you for the great introduction. I am so happy to be here. And I have my puppy Ranger, Park Ranger Maya here with me presenting cause I am actually working from my home right now. I'm not in the park. And so I am at First State National Historical Park here in Delaware. It's a little bit different than Bryce Canyon, Acadia, or Cape Cod. So unlike those parks where you're like, you get there and you made it to the park, First State is actually split up of seven unique sites across the entire state of Delaware. So it's a little different to try to get to like the park because it's a little bit of everywhere. So first up, I'm gonna start with the top of the state, go to the very bottom of the state here, we have our Brandywine Valley unit. This unit is 1,100 acres. So at here, you can explore about 18 miles of trails with your family, either by hiking, jogging, bicycling, riding a horse, or just walking around, whatever you wanna do. There's also access to the Brandywine River. So we do allow fishing, or you can go in and kind of look at some of the macroinvertebrates on some of the rocks and some of the smaller creeks. Going, if you want to go to the next slide, a little farther down south in the state, we have Fort Christina. This is where the Swedes originally landed here in Delaware. So what you can't see is to the right of this monument, there's some rocks there. And that is where the Swedes originally landed. So that's kind of cool to check out. There's also a replica of the Kalmar, Kalmar Nickel ship next door to this site, which is the ship that you see in the photo here. And you can actually take rides on that ship 
through the Kalmar Nickel Foundation. So that's kind of cool too. You can go on the next slide. Old Swedes historic site is tied directly to that first settlement with the Swedes. This is the church that they built despite being un under the English rule at that time. So the Swedish government wanted to make sure that their people had something that they could really cherish still despite being under the English rule. So they funded the building of this church. Do you wanna go to the next slide? We go all the way down to Newcastle here, still in the Northern County of Delaware. This is the Newcastle Courthouse Museum. This is where Delaware voted to separate from Pennsylvania and Great Britain all at the same time. And there's a lot of other really cool stories that have taken place in this building that I don't wanna spoil. So I wanna leave some things for a surprise for you to discover. Can we go to the next one? So we have officially traveled to the middle of the state here. This is the Dover Green. This is where Delaware ratified the United States Constitution, giving Delaware the honor of being the first state. This is also where First State National Historical Park gets their name from. Next. So John Dickinson Plantation is also located in Dover. It's about eh, maybe a five, 10 minute drive from the Dover Green, so not very far at all. And this is the home of John Dickinson, who is known as the Panem of the Revolution. So you can learn all about his childhood and everyone that helped work the land. And lastly, this is the Rives Holt House. Holt House. This is said to be the oldest house in Delaware. So it has seen a lot of history. And if you walk around the house, you can kind of see some of those unique history, mo historical moments that have occurred in the house, which is pretty cool. So together, these seven sites are gonna tell the story of early settlement with the Swedes, Dutch, and English and rival for power through ratifying the United States Constitution and actually testing some of those things in our Constitution. So those are the stories that you'll learn here at the park. But if you're not into history, we still do have all of those amazing recreational opportunities for you to enjoy as well. Thank you, Sam. I'm going to just check real quick to see if we had a question. Yes, so Miss Lori's first graders in Summers, New York, um, just wanted to do a shout out to Cape Cod National Seashore um, that they love visiting there. And I think a lot of the students right now are missing um, the opportunity to, to go to these places. We have a lot of questions happening on YouTube. So we have a question from Lindsay um, for you, Sam. Lindsay wants to know, what is the, to the total distance between all of the seven sites? about how long um, would it take to get from one end to the other? I don't have the total distance in miles off the top of my head, but it's about a two hour drive from the most Northern site to the most Southern site. But if you're gonna book a trip, you wanna make sure you accommodate enough time to take tours, take photos and get to really appreciate each site. So it could probably be a very good like one to two day full trip if you're coming to visit the park and you wanna hit all seven sites. All right, that sounds great. I just want to do a quick um, call out real quick and see, Kip, are you online? Indiana Dunes? I do not hear them. If we get them, I'll go back to that. But so that means Jennifer, um, you're up next with Mammoth Cave. So I will share the screen for you and um, this is another fascinating place. So Jennifer, we're ready. Thank you very much. Well, hello everyone. I'm Ranger Jennifer with Mammoth Cave National Park. And we are actually known um, and famous for being the longest cave in the world. And currently we have over 400 miles of mapped passageway, but there's a lot of really awesome things to do above ground as well. So this is one of the entrances to the park. And you can see that in Kentucky, sometimes we get a lot of snow. And um, the next picture is a really pretty picture that shows our river valley. So Nash Mammoth Cave has over 52,000 acres above ground. So 400 plus, who knows what miles of cave, but 52,000 acres above ground and we have beautiful hiking 
The winter time is a really great time to go hiking here at the park because where the leaves aren't on the trees, as you can see here, um, you actually have really great visibility. You can see across these valleys um, to these hills we call knobs. And you can also do things like horseback riding. Um, there's canoeing and kayaking and the Green River and the Nolan River. Those are two rivers above ground here at the park. Um, and if you'll go to the next picture, this picture is from last week. These are called frost flowers. And when conditions are just right outside, we get these beautiful frost flowers. So I love this one because it looks like it's sort of shaped like a heart. And when you think of Mammoth Cave though, you probably think of the cave. And so this picture is from a long time ago. And you'll see that the first tree um, that was put down inside Mammoth Cave that we know of was back in 1886. And if you look, you'll see there's all kinds of little things hanging off of it. Those, those aren't really ornaments. What those are um, are visitors that would come into the cave and visit. They would leave their names behind and they would put those on the tree year after year. Now we don't have a real tree inside the cave anymore. But if you see the next picture, you'll see that we do still put a tree inside the cave. So if you're visiting Mammoth Cave today, right now, I'm getting ready to go into the cave on a tour here in about an hour, um, I'll get to see a big giant tree. And we do that because we have a really special event and everyone is invited. Um, this year it was virtual. So you can get on our social media pages and you can see um, a virtual program that was posted this past Sunday, but hopefully next year things will be back to normal. So this year was the 41st annual Cave Sing. And the Cave Sing is a free event. It's held every year on the first Sunday in December at two o'clock central time. And anybody from all over the world can come and you get to walk down inside the cave and you'll notice these people are holding candles and there's a group over here singing. We sing all kinds of fun songs. Um, sometimes they'll sing the state song for Kentucky, my old Kentucky home, which is kind of a fun thing. Um, and sometimes there are orchestras that will come play music. Um, one year there was a brass quintet. Um, there was a barber shop chorus. It was uh, a bunch of gentlemen that were singing one year. So we have different people come every year, but it's a really neat event and it's called the Cave Sing. And when it's over, we come out of the cave and Santa Claus is always here. And so you'll see here, this is one of our rangers, Ranger Chris. I um, guess he's telling Santa what he wants and one of the elves. So it's a fun event that we'd like to invite everyone to in the future. But thank you all. Thank you, Jennifer. And we had a wonderful time exploring the cave back in June. We do have a question for you, Jennifer. Um, why is it called Mammoth Cave? That's a great question. Why is it called Mammoth Cave? Well, it doesn't actually have anything to do with the animals, the mammoths from long ago. It's called Mammoth Cave because it's so big. Um, it's a describing word. And so a long time ago, Mammoth Cave um, had a few different names. It was actually called the last name of whoever owned the property at that time. So if um, Miss Daisha Jones owned it at that time, back in the 17, 1800s, it would have been called Jones's Cave or maybe um, Scott's Cave if Ranger Alusha was the owner. But many, many years ago, over a hundred years ago, um, there were some visitors and some reporters. And um, back in those days, they didn't have social media um, but they did write letters and there were also newspaper articles that would come out because Mammoth Cave has been opened to visitors since 1816. So tours have been going in on almost a daily basis for over 200 years. And so those early visitors would write about their trip to this big, gigantic Mammoth Cave. And then people started using that over and over. They would say, oh, did you read that article about that mammoth cave? 
and it just sort of stuck. So that's how we became the Mammoth Cave. Great question. Thank you so much. Um, we do have other questions, but we're going to ask them to hold those for just a few minutes till we get to our STEM challenges. But before that, um, I just want to check again to see if Kip is on the call from Indiana Dunes. And if not, Michael, you're up next. So I'm going to let you um, share your screen if you would like to. Michael is a ranger from Yellowstone National Park. So that's going to be our furthest west and north park, I believe. So Michael, take it away. All right, I'm glad to see everybody from all over the place. I gotta say Bryce Canyon's got the coolest name. My last name is pronounced Bryce as well. Um, I'm nice. talking to you from three different states. Um, so uh, Yellowstone is in the Rocky Mountains where Wyoming and Montana and Idaho all come together. Park's mostly in Wyoming and that's where I am at this moment, but Montana and Idaho are not too far back. I'm gonna let Yellowstone share its winter self with you, um, share its magic on its own um, with with a little math because we're a STEM class and, uh, and a little music. So let me share my screen. And uh, you, you can join me if you want. <clears throat> on the 12th day of winter, Yellowstone gave to me 12 species feeding, 11 people skiing, 10 furs a leaping, 9 geysers dancing, 8 bison steaming. Seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying, five snowball rings, four calling birds, three bears not in dens, two kinds of grouse, and a bald eagle in a pine tree. <laughs> that is what it's normally like in winter. And if you were keeping track of the math, I wasn't really counting correctly. Sorry for that. <laughs> so Michael, I have a question for you, if it's okay. Um, what's open right now at Yellowstone if people wanted to visit? Yeah, if you come to the northern part of the park, here's a picture of Yellowstone, the whole thing. Um, the northern part, which is in the bottom of this map, this is the lowest elevation. So that's open all year. We're able to plow the roads. That's from the Mammoth Hot, Sp <laughs> backwards. Mammoth Hot Springs all the way over to the, the Lamar Valley. The rest of the park is currently closed. We have been letting the snow pile up for about a month. It's going to open this weekend to snow vehicles only. That means uh, a snowmobile or a snow coach, which is basically a van on treads or on giant uh, puffed up tires um, that can drive on top of the six feet of snow that's usually there. Um, and so for most of the winter, it'll just be, uh, you can get into the park, but only on those snow vehicles. Um, and then around May, we'll plow, April, May, we'll plow and uh, let cars in again for the spring. Nice. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we're now getting ready to start our STEM challenge. So students, if you brought your supplies with you, we're gonna ask that you go ahead and get those out. And I'm going to share the screen so we can see where we are heading. Thanks for your patience with a little tech problems here, but I think we're gonna be okay. So we, um, talked to the rangers in the park and found out that there are some problems that they have um, with the park. And one of those problems is that there's trash in the park. People are, are visiting um, the place, but then they are leaving their trash there. So we have a STEM challenge for you. We're going to ask that you use five things that you got out of a junk drawer. 
So five things that you found in a junk drawer. Um, and one of those it will include some tape. And we want you to design and create a trash can receptacle that will be placed at one of the parks so that people will be drawn to it to want to throw their trash away. So think about this for a moment. If you've ever been to a, an amusement park, sometimes they have really cool trash cans with faces, with comics on them. Sometimes you have trash cans that speak um, or move around. So we want you to create this type of trash can that will encourage visitors to throw away their trash. So I'm gonna show you my um, materials. So let's see, we're having trouble with, oh, I know what it is. Uh, Michael, can you not, can you stop sharing your screen? Hmm. Well, let's try something else. Um, I will show them this way. So I have some tape and in my junk drawer in the kitchen, I found a marker. I found a little container that um, I used to do uh, uh, Mentos and Diet Coke experiments. I found a French fry tray and I found a pack of ice breakers. So I want you to use your materials to, we have about five, four minutes to think about what you could build with your materials. We want you to try to build some type of trash can. So we're gonna ask that you all start building now. And if you want to pull your camera down just a little bit, like mine, so you, we can see your hands as you start to build, now, those of you on YouTube that are building with us, we have quite a few. We want you to take pictures of what you're building and upload it to the Padlet. In YouTube, I am putting the name of the Padlet that you will upload yours to. So let's go ahead and start beginning. And Rangers, we want you to do it too. All right, here we go. I'm gonna leave the screen as a four by four or a six by six right now so we can sort of see people's work. And if I see something I really like, I'm going to do some screenshots on that. Now, having so many park rangers here today, there's a good chance that they will share your design with um, the park service. Um, I know the maintenance crews at the Park Service would love to find ways to encourage people to get rid of their trash. So this is going to be a good way to do that. I'm just checking messages right now. People are watching. Yep, we're good. So let's keep building. And um, when you're ready to share your idea, it may not be completely um, finished but you may be ready to share your idea. Would you just unmute your microphone and talk to us, share with us? All right. Hey. So what, mine, what mine is, is it's like a, it's like a trash can, but you like, it's like a basketball hoop, so like you squirt, squirt this. Now you can have this, but then you can take this piece off. It makes it a lot okay. easier. Nice. Put this on, it makes it a little bit harder. Can, can you tell us what materials you found in your trash drawer? Um, I'm, I, I'm intrigued. Um, a peek. Part of the PVC pipe two. Uh, I forget what these are called. Close pins. Close pins. And then I'm uh, using tape. And then I just got for, tape. For this, I'm using some styrofoam, which has two holes, and a screw that you know I put on bunk beds. It's a newer type. Nice. Lisa, I'll ask you for just a moment. Um, is it you think this is a trash can that you guys could use at Acadia? Can you talk to Ansley for a minute? Uh, 
Um, actually. Oh, sure, Ansley, did you want to say something? Go ahead. This is Paxton, I mean, Wait, we're using Okay. That's why it says it. Okay. So Lisa, what do you think about their design? I think that is amazing. I think it uses a lot of creativity, a lot of great background knowledge. And those are the kinds of things that we're looking for uh, when people, when we are engineering uh, new items to be used uh, in our parks and elsewhere. So I think I'm gonna give that a big thumbs up. And Paxton and Ainsley, I love the idea also that you used recyclable materials to build this. That was very smart. Thank you for sharing. Would you unmute your uh, microphone one more time, Ainsley and Paxton, so your picture, and just talk for a second? Uh, um, so do you have a name for your invention? Trash uh, dunk, because you dunk it. That's okay. Dunk. Oh, yeah. I like it. Very nice. Thank you for sharing that. Is there anyone else that's in the Zoom call that would like to share? Justine, would you like to share? I will be my son Felix talking, so here. Okay, Felix, come on. Can you um, look up the I got in one of my broken toys with the wheel fall off. One, one of my cousins broke it off. And then I use a stick and then the paper clip appears like a flag so that people can go. And I got a cover to open it, um, sh close it, the trash can. And then I got um, another cover at the bottom who can block the, the garbage from falling on the ground. Nice. And I got elastic to attach them. Very nice. Um, Jennifer Shackelford from Mammoth Caves, why would it be important for um, our inventor here to put a top on this? Can you tell us what you're thinking, what that would do for Mammoth Cave? Because it does have a lid. How would that help you guys? Well, that's a great, great thing that you did there. That would help us because one of the things that's really important at Mammoth Cave is the cave is actually formed by water. Did you know that? Underground rivers carved out Mammoth Cave and they're still there down deep inside the cave. And so whenever it rains outside, all the water on the surface in this area, it ends up down inside those underground rivers. And there are sinkholes, which are like funnel shaped depressions in the ground. And sometimes they are kind of big openings. So trash can even go down inside those sinkholes and it can pollute the water. And we have to take care of our water. So that's a great design because that's going to help keep the trash out of those sinkholes. Good job. I like how it's clear as well. Maybe yeah. visitors would see, oh, it's almost full. I need to go find another trash can somewhere. Very nice. Thank you for sharing that. Is there anyone else um, online that would like to share their design? We're getting several questions from um, YouTube. People are sharing. Some, some of the classes that are on YouTube are going to be um, sharing theirs and then uh, in their classrooms as soon as this is over. So they're actually going to be doing this as part of a class project. Um, let's see, Ashley, do you have anything? Or Leo and Callie? If you want to share you yours, share you, yours you just unmute. That's right. So I made this. Yep. I made this. And how it looks is you can toss the trash in here and that's it. But also if it's at night and you can't see it. it, it oh, wow. All right, great job. Thanks, Dylan. Anybody else, Evan? Yeah, still working on So Dylan, that was a really good, um, Ashley, we'll let this stay open for a minute in case you have another student come over, but let me go to Bryce Canyon for a second. Chelsea, what do you think about a trash can that has lights on it? 
That's such a great question. So I really liked that last design. It's important to be able to see those, those garbage cans and having that light beacon is gonna be really, really helpful. Now here at Bryce Canyon, we're actually a dark sky park like Ranger Taryn was talking about. We are known for our pristine night sky. And so the only modification I would make to your really awesome design is just to make sure that that light was red capable so that our eyes stayed adjusted to the dark sky. But that was a really, really awesome design that you created. Yeah, Chelsea, thanks for that. And Dylan, so what you might could do is look for some things like red cellophane paper that you could put over to sort of dim the light a little bit, but that's a great. Is there anyone else that would like to share theirs before we move to our next project? Hi, my name's Evan. Hi. Hi, so, Evan. Go ahead. I kind of made this, but I kind of used it first. I used some of my, I used like this container right here that I used. Um, there's, there was a cap for it. Um, and I also have this trophy. But under this, there's like, a, like this little, this thing. And I also have this I found in the nature. And um, under this, I have like this little, I have um, tape. So I, so I could stick it onto my trash can. And then I put all this stuff so I can cover it, so I could see. I love that you use some nature in that. So, Alusha, how well would that trash can work at the National Seashore? Um, well, similar um, to, I think he did say he had a cover on top. Yes. And similar to a lot of these designs, um, besides the water quality issues that Jennifer was bringing up, we also have wildlife management issues that can be related to trash in all of our parks. And so at the seashore, we definitely have some birds that if the trash is food related, we'll try to get close to that trash. Um, who here has seen uh, Finding Nemo? Raise your hand. Okay, remember when the seagulls are going, mine, 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 mine? Yeah. So they will eat just about anything and we don't want the seagulls swooping around and eating up the food trash that might be left behind. We also are having an issue at the seashore this year and in some previous years with coyotes getting a little too friendly and a little too close to people when they shouldn't be. So it's really important to keep that trash covered so that animals that are generalists like coyotes and seagulls that can eat a lot of different types of things don't get attracted to that human trash that has food in it. Very nice. Well, thank you so much for sharing. We're going to um, go ahead and move to our next idea. Um, we know that you guys are working in your classrooms and you're not finished yet, but we're gonna be giving your teachers and your families these decks so they can keep working on them. I'm going to just show you what our next uh, project is going to look like. Um, we're going to ask that for this one that you just gather materials, but we're going to do this at a different time. You know, right now is a hard time for a lot of people. They um, are out of work or they're working from home or learning from home and we're not able to get out and see all of our friends like we would like to. So I thought it'd be a cool idea if we could gather some materials together and then create something for a neighbor or a family member or someone that is in a nursing home. So I'm gonna show you my materials I found. I found some pine cones. Now, what I did with these pine cones is that I collected them several days ago, but then I put them in a bag so that the, um, so that the uh, bugs would come out of it, for example. So I didn't want just have the bugs in there. So I have these here and I'm trying to get my picture to come up, but I can't, so I'll just do it from here. So I have these and then I also found this fun looking thing. Looks like an old timey broom. And then I found some wonderful leaves and some rocks and some little acorns. So you may find different types of nature where you are. Um, 
Michael, I'm going to ask that you give us some advice, though. There's some nature that we probably shouldn't be picking up. Do you have any advice for students as they're looking for nature around their homes? Well, around their homes, I would say um, you're not allowed to collect feathers because birds are protected. And uh, you want to think, is, is that something an animal's going to use? Is it uh, something important to something in nature? A popular thing is to uh, do your artwork in nature and show people there and then let all the parts go back to where they are. And of course, if you're in a national park, then you, you can't take the stuff out, uh, but you can look at it while you're there. But yeah, you can make some pretty neat stuff out of nature's ingredients. Yeah, so Michael, and that's a really good point that we don't want to remove things from the park. And um, at the National Mall in DC, we're gonna have an event there this summer and our teachers are gonna be asked to find rocks and actually build something artistic right there where they find it, photograph it, but leave it for other people to sort of find and reflect on. So that would be a great idea. So we're gonna change the STEM challenge just a little bit. We're gonna ask that you find your materials in nature. So I'm gonna take these back outside around the pond where I collected them and let them stay in nature, but I'm gonna stay there with my coat on and I'm gonna build a really beautiful art sculpture using this. And then I'm gonna take my phone and take a picture of it. And then I'm gonna send that picture to someone who needs a little cheering up. Okay, so I'm hoping that that's what you will do too. Now, I have just noticed that uh, possibly Kip has joined us from Indiana Dunes, and we're almost through with this event, but Kip, if you're on, we sure would love um, for you to share with us. Um, here he comes. I see him walking this way. So Kip will give you another minute or two to, oh, no, that was fast. <laughs> we'll let you um, unmute yourself and uh, tell us all about where you are and then okay can you hear me now yes yeah so I'm uh I'm at Indiana Dunes National Park and uh and yeah what I thought I would do for the kids is have uh unfortunately I was going to be in the animal room and I was gonna show animal furs and live animals, but the Wi-Fi in the animal room won't work. So, okay. so I'm gonna have the stuff in my office because the Wi-Fi, um, the connection works in my office. So I'm gonna, I've got skis here. So when, when we're ready to rock and roll, I have skis to show them. And I, I'm gonna go get a pair of snowshoes and show them the snowshoes and maybe a couple animal furs. All right, well, Kip, um, this is gonna make you laugh. But I think that you are in central time. So you thought that we started at one o'clock your time. And we actually started at one o'clock yes. Eastern time. So we're at the end of this oh, already. Oh. But oh, okay. would you just go ahead? So would you go ahead and introduce yourself and just tell us where you are? And then we'll do a oh, little I'm video so with you later. That's <coughs> okay. okay. So you've, you've got it's hundreds so of people watching right now. So yeah, tell us about I where you so are. Bad. Okay, <laughs> Indiana Dunes National Park. Um, yeah, we're located on the southern shores of Lake Michigan. Um, and we're a very unique park because we've got um, industry all around us. We're, we're less than an hour from Chicago. And um, because we're on the southern shores of Lake Michigan, we have the flora and the fauna from the north, south, east, and west. That's the plants, the animals um, from the north, south, east, and west converging right there on those Southern shores. So our diversity is, is just unique. Um, we have more orchids in our park than the Hawaiian Islands do. We have scientists from around the world that come here um, year round to do studies about the plants and the animals uh, in the dunes and how um, they're so close proximity to, to industry. And as you guys probably know, diversity is key to life. Without the diversity that we have on this planet, we wouldn't have the food that we need to eat. We wouldn't have the air to breathe, fresh water, um, that type of thing. And so we showcase diversity here at Indiana Dunes National Park, not only the plants and the animals, but cultural diversity. We've had Native Americans and other people living in this area for thousands of years. And um, so we showcase that as well. So that's in, in a nutshell, that's, that's what we are, so. 
Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And I will also direct them to our video that you and I created with uh, Kim back Excellent. in June. And we'll do that. So um, students, so that is our national park. So today we have looked at Acadia National Park. We have looked at Bryce Canyon. We have gone to Cape Cod. And then we've moved over to Indi our first state and then Indiana, and then Mammoth, and then Yellowstone. And I think we've had just a really good look at what national parks are doing right now. So our last uh, thing we're gonna do together is we talked about making a snack. So I'm hoping that everybody has their snack materials ready, or if not, it's okay, um, that you'll get them ready for later. But our only thing is, my husband will not let me start a fire out in the garage. He says that it's not safe out here. So I have decided instead of, um, not, instead of starting a fire and getting in trouble, I'm going to come up with some ideas on the way that I can make my marshmallows and my chocolate melt. So we want to think about how you can make those melt. Teachers on the Padlet, there's an area where you can have your kids brainstorm some ideas. But I just had a uh, person that I pre-picked from the audience that has given me an idea about holding the chocolate in your hands and the marshmallows just for a really long time or shaking um, or moving your hands together so that you build up friction and then put those marshmallows in there and you can eat those. But I've got an even better idea. Here's what I'd like for you to try over the holidays. I would like for you to try to build your own solar cooker. Now these are used all around the world for actually cooking food when they don't have electricity. So the only things you're gonna need is a box with a lid. So a pizza box works well. Also a donut box or a shoe box. You're gonna need some black construction paper so you can reflect the light or absorb the light. You're gonna want some tin foil and some plastic wrap. Now, Google some ideas of how you can build this. And then I want you to share with us what you've cooked. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, don't cook meats because we can't, we cannot control or regulate the temperatures of that. But a marshmallow on top of chocolate sitting on top of a graham cracker is just awesome. So I want you to try that and you're gonna share it. As we finish up today, I wanna thank you for joining us for our holiday in the parks and share a couple of uh, things for you. First of all, I will be giving away some park um, swag to classrooms who complete the following things. Um, one of them is to go to bit.ly backslash holiday padlet. And when you click on that, it's gonna open this padlet and we already have people that are on there. So thank you so much, Molly and Ella for already be, being on there. We're gonna have a place for the Rangers to post their information. We're gonna have a place for you to put your nature project up here. We also want to thank uh, Stephanie um, for putting, uh, showing the inside of her trash can. We have a few questions really quickly. Uh, Amanda, this is for Jennifer. When do you do your tours and do you walk the entirety of Mammoth Cave? Can you answer that real quickly? Yes, I sure will. Hi, Amanda. Um, when we go into the cave and we're open every day except December 25th, um, because something kind of cool about the cave is it's always 54 degrees. So if it's snowy outside or if it's 100 degrees above ground, no matter what month, it's still 54 degrees down in the cave. Um, but when we go in there, we do certain tours and they're all different lengths. So today I'm going to go on a tour. Um, probably I'll make the 130 tour this afternoon. And it is... Ranger Kate's over here beside me. That's why I masked up. Am I on? 
Um, yeah, around a mile. We do have some tours that are up to five miles. We have a crawling tour where you put on a helmet and some knee pads and we wear coveralls and it's around five miles. Um, but most of our tours are one or two miles. Um, our most popular tour is probably called the Historic. And when that tour is open, it's two miles in two hours. Good question. Nice. So teachers, we also, and I will send this to you, we have a survey that we would love for you to fill out for us and I will send you the link to that. Uh, the main reason is we just wanna know how we did and what can we do differently for next time. We are a very um, small, um, expedition my, it's just my husband and I that run the expeditions in education but we have a huge network of friends so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put us back on gallery view and I want everybody that's here to make a really big smile and thumbs up and so I can take a quick screenshot and I just want to thank you all for joining us today for those of you that are in your classrooms do great work I'm sure that the park rangers would love for you to come and work with them sometime so we're gonna take a couple of screenshots. I see Ashley Cook's class up there and I see Miss Morris's class from Cape Cod. Our Rangers are going to be reaching out to you. So once you fill out the survey, they're gonna tell, you're gonna tell us what state you're in and then we're gonna ask the Rangers to reach out to you. So thank you so much for joining. Those of you that are on YouTube, if you will, um, send me a selfie of yourself and upload it to bit.ly backslash holiday padlet we would love to share you so thank you so much for coming this is dr drizzle with the national parks expedition challenge along with her amazing rangers and we're out of here <laughs>